You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. Now it's time for uh, the non-sermon. Uh, something a little different. We, at the beginning of the year, began a series of uh, conversations and chats about who we are, what's our identity. And uh, we looked at some topics like what we'd like to be and some of our commitments. Well, where we're going now, as I mentioned last Sunday, is we want to look at our culture now. And so the next five Sundays, we are going to be digging into the Grace Community culture, what we would love this group of people, this family, this community to value, because that's what culture is. It's the things that you value, the things that you live out, the things that you put priority in, the things that you value. So uh, that's going to take place over the next... um, five weeks or so. It's not going to be preaching in the conventional sense, how we uh, do it ordinarily, uh, because for this particular topic, it's a one-off chance. You only get to be a new church once. Uh, I'm just going to guide you through a whole lot of uh, values or traits. If you don't know what the word trait means, it just means a characteristic, a characteristic or a value, a value that manifests itself in behavior. So we're looking at our desired traits of what we would like to be. So that's where we're going soon. So if you were one of those people who were the six, you've only been coming for the last six months, let me give you a quick recap of what happened at the beginning of the year. We asked ourselves a question. What would we like to be? And we rather ambitiously answered that with two words. We'd love to be a grace community. And of course, that became our name. We'd love to be a community, which is Founded, stands on grace, lives off grace, and is directed and fashioned by grace. Then we asked a follow-up question. What are the hallmarks of a grace community or a community of grace? And we boiled that one down to two words, love and know. We'd love to love and know God. We'd love God to love and know us. We'd love to love and know other people. And we want other people to love and know us. So that's uh, something of our framework of what we really want to be, what some of the hallmarks are of uh, this church. We then said to ourselves, well, nice to have these love and know floating around and be a community of grace, but but what are are we going to commit to? What what is the action which is going to flow out of this? So we wanted to commit ourselves to four things. With this mindset of grace, being a community of grace, what four things do we want to commit ourselves to? Well, the first thing we want to commit ourselves to is taking and offering grace externally. Call that evangelism. Call that making disciples, if you will. Taking grace externally. Commitment number two. We'd love to establish grace internally, in-house, in this community. So we want to be committed to giving each other grace. Not only the folks external, but you and I, within the four corners, well, a few more than four, but within the confines of... uh, this community. The third thing we want to commit ourselves to, and you heard such a great advertisement for it today with uh, Ian and Mel, we want to commit ourselves to taking practical grace to this city, to the weak, to the lonely, to the vulnerable of uh, Singapore. We'd love to commit to taking practical grace. And then the fourth thing we want to commit ourselves to is helping everyone in this church flourish in your personal space. You wear many different hats. God has given you grace to do many different things. Be a father, be a husband in my case, be a friend, be a whatever your job is, so on and so forth. How can this community help you flourish in the things that God has given you grace for? We'd love to commit to that. Okay, that's the recap. Let's talk about culture. Culture. Many different ways we can talk about culture. I want to uh, quote my friend Isaac. Is Isaac here? Yeah. Okay, now I've, now I've exposed them. Anyway, Isaac's proxy, you can wave your hand. So Isaac and I were talking about this the other day, and his definition was this. Culture is the sum total of shared habits and expectations. It's as good as you can get it. Culture is the sum total of the shared habits and expectations. It's the values of the community, as I was saying a moment ago. A culture statement would read like a value statement. This is what, in, this, in these parts, this is what we value. It's the characteristics or the traits, to use that word again, that we would love to see here. All right. Now, because I'm ambitious, we've come up with 20 traits. Okay. Now, 
Either 20 is too many or too few. I don't know which. You can tell me at the end of the series. The point is not to try and memorize them all. I can't even recite all 20. So I know Singaporeans love to memorize stuff, and you guys are world class at knowledge in, knowledge out. This is not an exercise in that. This is like the family album. We've got a whole lot of different photographs of the culture. Ah, we were in Bali for Christmas last year. Ah, Easter lunch with Mel and Shahar. Ah, this is a photo of us on the beach. That's what we're doing over the next four weeks. We're just flipping through the family photo album, going like, hey, that would be nice. Oh, that would be nice. Oh, it would be great if the family did this. Oh, that's a nice idea. Oh, that kind of looks a bit like the other one. There's a bit of overlap. Don't worry if there's overlap. Don't be panicked. We're just painting a big picture so that you can absorb and smell and just be, get a taste of the community that we'd love to be. Okay, so you're, you're all with me on that. So no one has to memorize any of this stuff. I'm just speaking it out. And of course, words are cheap. We can all stand up here and have like the perfect church on paper. Hey, this is what we got to be. But the challenge is, is to latch on to one, two, three, four things. I don't know. Maybe pick one a Sunday and just go, that one's mine. I'm going to make sure we do that one at Grace Community. That's great. That's, that's a win for me as far as I'm concerned. The challenge is not just to talk about the stuff. The challenge is to experience it through someone else. And the challenge is to reproduce it to another person as well. So I'm just going big broad strokes, just going to whack you with a whole lot of different character traits. If they overlap and the definitions are not exact, give me grace. Okay, so the five we want to talk about today are, uh, number one, we want to be a gracious people. Number two, we want to be a personal people. Number three, we want to be a devoted people. Number four, we want to be a relational people. And number five, we love to be humble. Don't worry about trying to take it all down. I'm going to go quite fast this morning. On our app, whatever you see on the screen is going to be available on the app uh, after the service. Okay, so let's start with number one. Gracious. Gracious. What is this characteristic? Well, gracious people give the grace they have received from Jesus to other people. Gracious people give the grace they have received from Jesus to other people. Grace is God's favor to me, amounting to goodness in Christ. Grace is the gift of God's kindness to me. Grace is God leaning towards us, inclining towards us with favor to benefit us. That's what grace is. What's a good scripture to anchor this uh, idea in? Well, the Bible says that the ultimate act of grace kindness from God to us is found in Jesus. That is the ultimate definition of grace. In Christ, God is rich towards us. And it says this in Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ— By grace, so that whole idea is summed up. By grace, you have been saved. Okay, if that's grace, how does Jesus cause this trait, this characteristic, to flourish in this church? Well, the entire idea of Christianity is that God was kind to us in Jesus. Jesus died for our sins and rose again for our salvation. And we've been given the greatest possible gift We've got these uh, infinite riches from Christ. But here's the thing. It's a gift we did not deserve. We didn't earn it. It's not a reward for our good conduct. It's grace. And so if we really want to practice our Christianity or put our Christianity into practice, better put, we should treat other people in the spirit that God has treated us in. So that's the idea behind being a gracious people. We give others, especially those who've hurt us, we give others, especially those who've hurt us, gifts they don't deserve. Forgiveness, kindness, generosity, goodwill. That's what it means to be a gracious people, which Jesus has enabled us to be. All right, next question. Well, how does this idea of being gracious help me to love God, know God, 
Love people, know people. Well, because of these infinite riches that I've received, my response to God should be one of love. God, thank you for pouring this stuff out of me. How can I love you back? And of course, naturally, it leads the way to graciously loving other people, especially those who have hurt us. Uh, we, through the power of grace, are brought into relationship with God. And so grace, by extension, should lead us into relationship with one another. And that becomes the basis for our relationships. In human relationships, where grace is high, safety is high. And what flows from that is that trust is high. And that little framework is the best way that we can build relationships with each other. All right. What's an example of this? I just want to give you all a practical example as well. Well, I was recently in a place in Asia. And in this particular place, there was ethnic cleansing. And in a particular church, because the Christians were from two different tribes, one of the tribes got kicked out of the church. So a man started another church where these two tribes could come back together in the church, even though there was all this hatred between them, and that they could welcome each other. Wow, that is grace. Okay, that's an extreme example, but if it can be done at that level, then we can do it on a more micro level here in Singapore. All right, first trait was gracious. Second trait, personal. Personal. What does it mean for us to have a personal culture here? Well, being personal means to value a person as a unique, special person. I'd love this to be a place where everyone, doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, where you come from, what your background is, what your social status is, that you get treated as unique and special. I'd hate it if people got lost in the crowd. I'd love everyone to feel like they felt special in this church. I'd love everyone to feel known for who they are. So not just loved and accepted and tolerated in some way, but actually known one step further to actually be known. And so here's some examples just to challenge you all on how do you know when you are pers you're being personal with someone else? How do you know when someone is treating you personally? Well, okay, there's, no, uh, there's no winning answer to this, but let me just give you a quick framework. I feel, let me give it to me, I feel personally known when someone knows my past, my unique sins in particular, the bad mistakes I've made in the past. When people know your past, you, you feel well known as, as you as an individual. What about your unique present? The things that I'm facing now, my challenges before me now, situation in my life now, if people know that, they also know my past and they know what I'm facing now, oh, then I feel two out of three known. And then for the win, if people know my dreams, people know, hey, what does Perch really love about the future? Where is he? What is really burning in his heart? What are his hopes and his dreams for the future? Then, wow, then I feel really known. Another way we can know people and be personal is if we know enough about people to celebrate them where they're good, where they, their gifts, where they, where they do things well. That's a, a personal culture. Okay, is there a good scripture to talk about this? Well, there are many, I think, so I just clawed this one. Don't you think it's amazing that God knows you personally? I mean, just stop and think about that. You're not just some random serial number in a list of God's family in some big Excel document that goes into, you, what, eight figures or something. God actually knows you personally. Wow, that's quite a thought. And... To have a personal culture here, we should know people personally as well. It's the sort of thing God would do. So here's a verse. I love this one. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Well, just stop there. God knows the psalmist. We shouldn't just assume that every God does that. Okay, there's only one God, obviously. But that is an amazing character of God, that he knows people individually and personally. Oh, Lord, you've searched me and you've known me. You know when I sit. You even know what chair I'm on. And when I rise, you even know what time I woke up this morning. For some of you, it, it'll happen soon. Waking up. 
You discern my thoughts. So God even is in my head. He knows what I'm thinking. Wow, this is real intimate knowledge. You search out my path and my lying down. And you're acquainted with all my ways. God knows every minute, specific, accurate thing about you. That's God. That's who he is. Okay, how does Jesus enable us to have a culture here of being personal? Well, Jesus Christ died for my sin and rose to life for my salvation. It's highly personal. The Christian message is that I was known before the world began. God knew me. He formed me. He made me. He chose me. My sin against God is personal. Yet his eternal plan was to personally save me. You're dealing with radical, radical, radical sense of being personal in Christianity. God takes my sins against him personally, and yet he personally saved me so that I could have a personal relationship with him. That's where all of this is coming from. He knows his sheep by name. He's written my name on his hand. Everything about the message of Jesus is that it's personal, it's close, it's intimate. He knows you. He knows you. Therefore, I think we should treat each other likewise, according to the limits of our capacity. All right, how does being personal help me to love God, love people? Well, there's this fantastic relationship between being known and being loved. Uh, you can know someone really deeply. You can know someone really well. Think of people in your family. But it doesn't mean you love them deeply as well. So when you know people personally, exactly who they are, and over and above that, knowing the good, the bad, and the ugly, you then choose to love them and deposit love on everything that you know about them. Man, that's when uh, you feel personally loved. Church should be a community where everyone feels that they are known as the person they truly are by at least one or two or three other people. Can we aim for that? Can we aim for that everyone's experience here is that everyone gets the opportunity to be really known and loved over and above that? Okay, what's a good example of this? Well, someone the other day shared a very personal story. It's a story you can't make up. It's a story that is so highly unique and personal. It was with me and uh, someone else. And uh, people suffer, go through personal things which are totally unique to them, totally individual. No one has ever been through that situation before. And as a result, people feel a certain kind of shame which is highly personalized. But in being known and sharing this story, which I don't think had been told to anyone else, gives a chance for anti-shame to be applied. We're a church of anti-shame. We bring Jesus. We bring grace. We bring love. But it's applied personally, uniquely, to someone where they're at and who they are. So that was a beautiful experience for me a while back. All right. Can you remember? Number one? Trait number one. Oh, thank goodness for Debbie Chen. <laughs> Gracious. Okay. Trait number two. Personal. All right. Excellent. Number three is devoted. Devoted. What is this characteristic? Well, Christ is an absolute king who deserves absolute devotion. Christ is an absolute king who deserves absolute devotion. Those two ideas go together. He's the creator. He's the maker of everything. He's the ruler over everything. He's bigger than creation. All creation belongs to him. He's the total king. And he wants to rule our lives in totality. He's a total savior. Isn't that wonderful? He's gone to extreme lengths to totally save us. Because we're totally bad. <laughs> There's a totality to God. There's an absoluteness about him and about his salvation. The only appropriate response to such totality is, guess what? Is a total devotion to him with everything that we have and every possible way that we have. Every resource that we have should be donated, or at least not donated, sorry, wrong word. I'm trying to look past the speaker at all the good people. Hello, good people on the right here. 
Every resource we have, our time, our money, our things, our possession, our energy, all of it should be devoted to Him. I'm not saying devoted to the church. This is not a fundraiser. I'm saying devoted to God, devoted to God, devoted to Him, to glorify Him. When we are devoted to Him, we are adoring Him. Okay, what's a good scripture to uh, capture this one? Well, we've been so beautifully saved by Jesus that when the kingdom finds us and we find the kingdom, as it were, uh, the response is to give everything we have to him and his kingdom. I love this little one, uh, this parable of Jesus in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells, it's a big word, it's a three-letter big word, all that he has, and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom demands some kind of allness in response, a total devotion to him, like the merchants of this parable. Let's devote everything we have to this kingdom. It's only appropriate to dedicate all that we have to uh, this great king who has saved us. How does uh, Jesus cause this trait to uh, flourish in our midst? Well, the clear message of uh, the gospel is that God has been entirely devoted to us. There was nothing that he did not withhold from loving us. He gave us his son. And in receiving Christ, we get everything. We get his death, we get his righteousness, we get his life, we get his resurrection. We get his forgiveness, we get his inheritance, we get his relationship with the Father, we get his prayers. It's quite amazing. But that's not all. Not only has he not withheld anything from us, the Bible goes on to say, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Man, when this dirty tennis ball of a planet packs in, he's going to give us the new creation. It's going to become ours. Wow. And if we understand the allness of what God has given us in Christ, then uh, the natural response, I think, is total devotion back to Him. All right, how does uh, this trait of being devoted help us to love God, love people, and know God and know people? Well, being devoted to God includes being devoted to His body as well. One of the ways God wants us to be devoted to Him is if we are devoted to each other. We want to be devoted to the King's people, which is the church body. We also want to be, have a level of devotion to the King's city. All right, now, I need to temper this because the devotion we give to other people, of course, we're not making other people divine and we're not giving an, an inappropriate, undue level of loyalty and commitment to People. There's obviously a proportionality to this. However, at some level, there should be some level of commitment and loyalty to some other people in God's body. And you should also experience that, that some people are at some level committed and loyal to you. It works hand in glove like that. And that's one of the ways that our ultimate devotion is to God. So I just want to temper that. Okay, what's an example that uh, I can share with you of devotion? Well, I've got a friend who fasts one day a week every week. That's a level of devotion. Uh, I hear stories in this church of people who fast with other people and to God, devoted to God, devoting prayers to God so that we can see breakthrough in other people's lives. I love it when that happens in this church. It really excites me. Uh, I've got another friend who told me the other day that he was taking off 24 hours to be alone from, uh, away from wife and family just to be devoted to God and focused on Him in prayer. Uh, I've got another friend in this church who is constantly devoted to building other people up in Christ with prayers, with encouragements, with uh, words, with, uh, even with material possessions and things coming at a cost. Devoted to God and other people feel the blessing and the benefit of that. I've got another friend who helped a single mother 
who was in a terrible predicament to uh, come and live with his family for a couple of months. That's a real devotion to uh, Jesus' body, isn't it? Okay, gracious, personal, devoted. Number four is relational. Relational. Uh, one of the big characteristics of uh, Christianity is that it's, we have our relationship with God restored. God's a person. He's highly relational. In fact, when you think about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons who are super relational with each other. That's the ultimate in relational connection. And so our job is to mirror and to image. We're made in the image of God. One of those images is being super, super, super hyper relational. What does relational mean? It means connected. We get to demonstrate God as a relational God with other people. Uh, this trait is heavy on linking and bonding and connecting with, uh, with other people. That's the, the nub of what this is. Hanging out, having fun, connecting. Church is a glorified network of friendships that talk about Jesus. Church is a glorified network of friendships that talk about Jesus. Can I encourage you all to make friends, to be friendly, and to do things that friends do, and to yet do it in, in an environment or an atmosphere of uh, connecting and uh, meaningfully speaking about Christ? We'd rather go slowly and know less people better than have a bigger church where relationships are thin. Should I say that one again? We'd rather go slowly and know less people better than have a bigger church where relationships are thin. We want to prioritize time with each other. When it comes to the design of church activities, we don't want to have so many programs that we drown out time to be relational. Because we like being relational. All right, what's a good verse to encapsulate this? Well, here's a quick one. Uh, 1 John 4, verse 12. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us. In other words, there's this bridge of connection and fellowship and linkage and bonding with each other. When we do that stuff, God comes and lives in those links and in those connections. It's a way of God making his home down here on earth through us. And then other people get to see that. Uh, how does Jesus help us to have these relationships? Well, let me put it to you like this. If we know what a good and healthy relationship with God feels like in Christ, then we can know how to have good and healthy relationships with other people. Jesus is our model for uh, how that can happen. People often ask me, we want to serve, we want to help in Grace Community, what shall I do? Well, here's an answer. The best way you can serve at Grace Community is to be an outstanding Christian friend to at least one other. The best way you can serve in this community is relationally, is to link with others to help them Flowing from that in their Christian faith. Okay, what's, uh, we've got one more to go. You're doing well. Hang in there with me. What is a good example of this? Well, recently I had lunch uh, with a couple after church, uh, some visitors, and uh, I asked the person, you know, what is your, do you have hobbies? And the person said, he plays basketball. Oh, I said, uh, you know, but he interrupted me. He said, don't worry, I've already been invited by the uh, basketball interest group at uh, Grace Community. There you go. Thank you, Jason. So I immediately said to him, watch out for Trenty cheats. <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful thing, that people just getting connected, having fun, doing things with each other. Uh, I also hear stories of uh, people inviting random people for lunch, and by the end of the lunch, they are non-random, because they've suddenly got to know each other. So uh, that's wonderful. Keep it going. Hey, you might score a free lunch by today at the end of this, uh, this message. All right, number five is uh, humble. Leon, you smiled way too big <laughs> for that free lunch comment. Leon, I'll buy you lunch anytime. All right, humility. What is this characteristic? We're nearly there. Last one. Well, humility is making yourself nothing so that God can be everything. 
Humility is making yourself nothing so that God can be everything. Christ made himself nothing, becoming a servant. That's what it says in the NIV in Philippians 2. Christ made himself nothing, becoming a servant, to put the interests of others ahead of his own interests. Humility sees God as great. Humility is preoccupied with gazing at the greatness of God that it forgets to be self-obsessed. Humility is preoccupied with gazing at the greatness of God that it forgets to be self-obsessed. Humility doesn't need to be superior to others or think highly of itself because humility is content just to be attached to Christ, who is the most superior. Humility feels like it is already so blessed in Christ that it ought to bless others. What's a good scripture to understand this? Well, this is a verse I try and pray every day in the morning. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Live a life worthy of the calling you've received. This is the NIV. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Man, you got to think about that. Be completely humble. It's like, there's only one standard of humility, and that's complete humility. Absolute humility. Comprehensive humility. That's the only appropriate response to this calling that you have been called into in Christ. It's complete humility. It only comes in one size. Humility is complete humility. And, this is a pairing in the scripture, by the way, one of the first fruits from humility is gentleness. It says that multiple times in the New Testament. So if you're not gentle, if gentleness is absent from your life, then you should trace your steps back to humility. All right, how does Jesus help us to have this flourish? Well, needless to say, we've received so much from God in Christ. We should stand continuously amazed and in awe at Him and all that we do every moment of our lives. We have received so much. We should uh, be experts at um, modeling Christ and considering the interests of others as superior to our own. Humble people are good at loving God. Humble people are fixated on God and His greatness, His power and His bigness. Humble people are good at deflecting away from themselves and choosing to love the interests of others and be interested in others, rather. Humble people love hearing about other people's interests. Humble people are less of me and more of you. Humility, in a word, is at the heart of our motto to love God and love people. Humility is the basis. All right, and I end with an example. Uh, I had a situation the other day where someone I know, I know well, but not super well, called me up and said they'd like to take me out for coffee. And then this person apologized to me for something. To be honest, I didn't think it was as big a deal as the person was making. But the humility to humble yourself and to apologize to someone is vast and great. And I thought to myself, that is a humble person. Amen. I think uh, the way we'll end, let's have a moment or two to pray, and uh, then James can uh, close out uh, the service for us. Thank you, you Pitch. Yeah. So, won't you all just uh, close your eyes? Lord, so many big ideas today. But ultimately, we hear one big idea of you and your love for us. Lord, as we set out on this journey, we just want to thank you. Thank you for the ACRA approval. Thank you for so many good things that you are doing and releasing and setting in motion. Thank you for another year's uh, venue here. Lord, in all things, as this community is built and gets going, we ask that we would be these things, gracious to each other, 
personal with each other, devoted to you and committed to each other. Always relational, having fun and fellowship, and ultimately humble, mirroring you and who you are. So Lord, uh, we know that we fail at these things all the time on a regular basis. But would you help us? We want to sink these values into this community. And so would you help us to uh, be all of these things? You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.